It's it's interesting to me because it seems like in general, I think we talked about this when we talked about like the feminism episode, which if you guys haven't seen it, you should you should check it out. But yeah, there we're is in a, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we show up briefly. <laughs> so uh, there is a spectrum of male archetypes, in my opinion, in Game of Thrones. And you have basically in my in, in, in my assessment, two types of guys. You have strong but dumb or weak but clever <laughs> like <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, on, on the one hand you have someone like Jon Snow who in the show at least is very strong he's very brave but he's not very clever in terms of like he always gets outmaneuvered by uh, if you word that right it could be a million dollar <laughs> catchphrase Hello, and welcome to Bite Marks, a podcast for gamers by gamers about politics. Although today, we're going to be talking about a different kind of game altogether. The Game of Thrones! Dude, I didn't really, I didn't think that through. Anyway, we're talking well, actually, today, well, we're talking about House of the Dragon, but yeah, uh, we're joined today by uh, Emilio, my lovely co-host. Hi, Emilio, he, him, also really into swords. <laughs> a powerful statement, a powerful opening statement to any conversation. And uh, we're also joined today by Hills Alive. Hi, I am Hillary, aka Hills Alive. Go by she, her. Cool. And I am Callum. I go by he, him. And today we are talking about House of the Dragons, not technically Game of Thrones, but the joke wouldn't work otherwise. Emilio? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, it is technically a game, but... It's a different type of game because it's about civil war instead of, you know, regular civil war. I guess technically the, the, the plot of Game of Thrones is kind of a civil war because like, OK, no, I don't want to get into it. Well, you um, certainly caused the civil war in my heart. But today we're going to be talking about specifically a character from House of the Dragon, Kristen Cole, who is duplicitous. Would you say? He, Kristen Cole, I think, for me, is a very interesting character. Um, I, I think that uh, in some ways he embodies like the best and the worst aspects of like West Orsi society, and he's very divisive. Uh, you know, I, I think in terms of like just engaging with the fan community, I feel like some people hate his guts, some people like absolutely love him. I, I think it doesn't help that he's played by like a really handsome guy. <laughs> yeah, he is fantasy Nicolas Cage in that he doesn't have like middle ground he's just highs and he's just lows yeah i i okay hillary you might i think you made a comment about this but like fabian frankel is a really handsome guy and they also don't age him up for some reason yes they do yeah. oh no i mean <laughs> one of my uh sort of issues with house of the dragon is obviously that like the only characters that they actually age up are the female lead characters and like all of the dudes are played by the same actors throughout the entire first season other than the children um but, yeah. Uh, yeah yeah it is kind of weird how we go from like creepy western girl to young adult and then fabian frankel is just over there looking like he, he just looks the same like 10 years of boss he looks like this he no he's got the salt and pepper and stuff come on that's not a drastic like <laughs> amon young amon looks nothing like uh the mega chad that is is his name <laughs> Ewan Mitchell? Yeah, because he went through like 25 years of off-screen sword training. <laughs> Have you seen? He's got like a he's got like a comic book jawline. All right, like the. Let's not it, be it, it, mean to the man. He has one eye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a. Uh, it is pretty funny. Uh, so Hillary, why don't you give us maybe a brief summary about Kristen Cole? Uh, maybe just a, bi a short biography, and then uh, we'll go from there. Okay, uh, Kristen Cole, I believe, is from the Dornish Marches in the Stormlands. Mm -hmm. Let me double check that with the wiki. Um, he obviously is portrayed by Fabian Frankel. He was began as more of a black supporter, allegedly, but obviously wound up becoming one of the key players in the Greens. Um, obviously, don't want to go too far into spoiler territory with that. 
But um, yeah, I, I I think just off the top, we're not going to be spoiling anything that hasn't been shown in the show already. And um, yeah, just to give you a heads up, when we say greens and blacks, we mean the two sides of the civil war in this fantasy show. Please right. do not tweet at me. <laughs> no, tweet at Callum, but tell him how how cool he is. No, um. don't tweet at me at all. <laughs> Ignore me. Um, yeah, he. He's a he's a knight, right? Like you you would say, Hillary, that the defining thing about Christian is that he really is like a knight. Yeah, and he sort of um, he does fulfill a really interesting fantasy archetype, and then obviously subverts that archetype mm -hmm. in that he is a relatively lowborn person. Mm -hmm. um, he's obviously not like a commoner, but uh, House Cole really wasn't a significant part yeah. of the yeah, Starlands or the world of Westeros. They were stewards, right? In like they were stewards to House Dondarrion. I believe so. Yeah, in yeah. Blackhaven, okay. I think. I wrote I like copy pasted the wiki page onto <laughs> a uh, word document. So yeah, they are. A, so an interesting thing about that, right? So obviously one of the wacky things about feudalism is that feudalism has to invent like loads and loads of roles for people. You know, like in real life you would have like the the king's like Fook, uh, fork uh, tester or, you know, the, the soup eater. Or, you know, you just have uh, all sorts of weird, like, positions. Um, I think it's interesting that Cole is born into the peripheries of nobility, but he's not specifically born a commoner. Uh, I think that's, like, a very right. important aspect of, like, why he is... Because he's also very ambitious, right? Right. Yeah. I yeah, um, I would tend to agree with that. Obviously, like, canonically, it wouldn't make that much sense if he was a commoner and managed to um, become one of the best knights in the land. So yeah. um, putting him in a position where he at least has access to sort of the higher classes but um, isn't necessarily a part of them seems mm. to be a pretty obvious uh, intentional choice. Although, Dunk, from the Dunk and Egg stories, was a commoner that did become a hedge knight. That is true, yeah. but Dunk is meant to be a parable about more traditional chivalric characters, because Dunk is also a knight errant. He goes around wandering Westeros with Egg, doing all kinds of, like, shenanigans. But, like, the inciting incident for Kristen Cole is the tourney at Maidenpool, right? Yes, yes. Uh, for uh, Viserys' ascension to the throne in, I think, 103 AC? Or something like that? Yeah, I think it says 104 according to the wiki, but... Oh, gosh. <laughs> did you just um actually me on my own podcast? Uh, Women are did. taking over. <laughs> Free the incident. Anyway, um, I do want to bring up something that I found interesting about the show, which is not mentioned at all on the wiki or anything, mm -hmm. is that Alicent, in the very first episode where they introduce Kristen Cole, says that he's Dornish. Hmm. Oh, does she? Yeah, she, like, turns to Rhaenyra when Kristen takes his helmet off after kicking the absolute shit out of Damon, and she's like, oh, he's Dornish! <laughs> I think... Well, he is from the Dornish marches, right? So I guess it would make sense if he was at least partially ethnically Dornish. It, it's kind of... from sort of right the border of uh, Dorn and the Stormlands. It's kind of interesting, because... Uh... Obviously, ethnicity is a very complicated issue in Game of Thrones, but, like, uh, Bobby and Frankel <laughs> has a relatively dark skin, uh, you yeah. know, um, and if I'm not mistaken, he has, like, Jewish ancestry, <laughs> uh, but if, so. you, if you Google just, like, pictures of Kristen Cole, a lot of them make him seem just, like, a very, like, White as know, the uh, driven snow. Like a very pale, a very pale, like, guy with super black hair. I, th I think that's kind of interesting because Dorne is meant to be the Spanish analog. So, you know, ethnically speaking, you could you could make a case either way, you know, because I feel like someone like Christian Cole could really show up in most spots of Westeros and no one would really bat an eye, except for maybe like the north. Jeez. <laughs> um, oh, Imagine if a Spaniard just showed up in Scotland, basically. <laughs> but um, w why I bring this up is because if if we take that as like to mean literally like he is partially Dornish or has Dornish heritage that puts so much implications in what kind of childhood Kristen Cole might have had that mm. influences who he could have been so much because the Dornish marshes are famous for fighting the Dornish 
constantly. Mm. Right. Well, isn't it mentioned that Chris? Because there's a scene in the show where Rhaeny uh, Rhaenyra has to choose her king's god, and she's presented with a bunch of knights. It's actually one of my favorite scenes. Not only just because like they get the armor actually really nice. Uh, generally, I, I don't like the quality of armor on, on Game of Thrones, The Song of Ice and Fire, you know, these types of material. But that scene in particular is really well done. But doesn't she choose Kristen because he's actually had combat experience in a time when many knights just haven't been fighting? Yeah, that's how he got like knighted. A... He got knighted fighting the Dornish. Yeah. And uh, then, you know, he's quite renowned as his, uh, a martial fighter. Uh, he beats uh, Damon, which is not, which is descri- described as being very unusual, right? Damon is yeah. like the, uh, he's like the Morbius. <laughs> yeah. He, oh God! But also, he beat Damon <laughs> while Damon was holding a magic sword. Yeah. Is it's, it magic? It's it. Well, people think it's magic, Emilio. Geez. Okay, fair enough. But um, that's the. Isn't that the point? Is that the swords aren't actually magic, but they're supposed to like symbolize power? And Kristen beat Damon while Damon was wielding one of these symbols of power. It is kind of interesting that he beat him with a Morning Star, uh, because Morning Stars are, uh, you know, not necessarily an ideal weapon for making combat, <laughs> um, but uh, they hit pretty hard. Maybe that's like a representation of like uh, it's a, it's an interesting choice because Morning Stars are kind of blunt weapons, but they do require finesse. And Kristen Cole is kind of a blunt character. He is a blunt instrument. Yeah, like uh, so. To skip a little bit of ahead, once once he gets once he becomes Rhaenyra's um, king's god. A major part of the show, especially, uh, I'm not necessarily sure if it's that like explicit in the books, but a major part of the show is that he kind of becomes embroiled in an illicit uh, affair of sorts with Rhaenyra, and he's just completely out of his depth socially. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Would you agree with that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Um, I think that in the books it was sort of vaguely alluded to, and obviously, like. The canon of the books isn't necessarily always canon. It's all from very weird points of view um, that mm-hmm. aren't very reliable. But um, yes, within the show, obviously he becomes embroiled in a, a relationship with Rhaenyra. Um, that he. It's an interesting dichotomy because obviously he has almost no power in the situation. Um, and given his characterization obviously we don't know much about his upbringing within the show at this point but um given his uh sort of devotion to knighthood uh it's understandable the way in which his relationship with Rhaenyra affects him in sort of a mentally destabilizing way uh makes sense and is interesting but also has obviously a pretty negative effect on his personality Mm -hmm. why do you think Kristen is so committed because in a lot of ways, uh, you know, many of the characters like in often you have characters. Mar- Martin loves to play with like the concept of chivalry in Game of Thrones. You have characters like Jamie, who's like supposedly a golden knight. But then you look at him, he's kind of rotten and corrupt and evil. And then you've got uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, the the tall woman. Brienne. Um, Brienne, yeah. And she's like she's, you know, a woman, but she also is like in, in a lot of ways, the embodiment of knighthood. And I feel like in A House of the Dragon, uh, Kristen Cole is that character who's meant to like be a discourse about like chivalry and what it really means. Well, um, that that isn't that just the thing because in the books, well, in the book Blood and Fire, um, it, it's basically a, a a history written in the canon of the world, right? And it mm-hmm. has various yeah. sources going on. Specifically, the two main ones are Septon Eustace and Mushroom, who is a court jester at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, now, if you read the book, Septon Eustace tends to discuss everything very politically and with like a great sense of like nobility and everything. And Mushroom tends to be the one that's like, oh, this is all the illicit stuff that was happening. But weirdly, right. like Mushroom is the one that goes and says, no, Kristen Cole rejected Rhaenyra. She was the one who tried to seduce him. And that's odd. Because you'd think that he, like Mushroom as the informant, would be the one who's trying to be like, no, they they both were in love with each other totally. But it seems like amongst the common people, Kristen is sort of the symbol of nobility. And I think it's to do, again, like we said earlier, with the fact that he is relatively lowborn. 
Right. Um, yeah, I think that's probably a fairly accurate insight as to why Mushroom might be more positive towards him than he is towards most people, especially since, like, Mushroom's interpretation of Rhaenyra tends to be quite favorable towards her. So for him to be like, oh, no, she's the one who seduced him is is definitely uh, noticeably strange. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, it, it's kind of interesting because, you know, because he's in this uh, situationship, I guess, with Rhaenyra, uh, it puts him in a real difficult bind. In the show, he basically breaks down with the stress and he kills... Um, he kills uh, Lenor's uh, boyfriend, Joffrey Lonmouth. Yeah, Joffrey Lonmouth, right? And uh, obviously, you know, he expect. I think one of the most interesting moments in the entire show is when he basically breaks down and tells Alicent, and I think he expects to be killed. <laughs> well, he expects yeah. to be gelded and then killed because there was mm. a King's Guard knight before him that also broke their vows of chastity, and he was gelded and then sent to the wall. I think. Yeah, this, this whole, like, chastity vow thing, it never really works out. <laughs> yeah, turns out telling people that they're not allowed to have sex makes them really want to have sex. Wild. Right. You, you could look at plenty of historical examples of, like, like, the Praetorian Roman guards, far from the bastions of, like, honesty and nobility and, and decency, they were basically just, like, thugs in purple. So, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's kind of funny to me that society will enforce these norms that are very clearly not going to work, but they still do them anyway, you know? Actually, uh, speaking of thugs in purple, Kristen is... Ba- I, what, uh, one thing I really loved is that during an interview, Fabian Frankel said, like, he described Kristen as basically a thug. And I think that's really <laughs> interesting because, in essence, that's what he is. He's just like, if he hadn't become a knight... He could have been like a bandit or something. It's the fact right, that or like he. Or like a sword. Pardon? Or like a cell sword. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. It, it's the fact that someone gave him a fancy set of armor and a title that makes him like noble. Because he's. Isn't just... that kind of. Yeah, but isn't that kind of like the point? Like the only difference between a, a bandit and a knight is like the legitimacy of the system. There's no like real difference between their, their behavior. You know, because like uh, Gregor Clegane is a knight, but he's not a <laughs> he's not a good guy, is he? <laughs> yeah, he's the mountain yeah. that rides, I believe. Is such a good fucking name. <laughs> Just first of yeah. all, that rules. <clears throat> Hell yeah, yes. George, get it, King. <laughs> so yeah, he. So as you mentioned, uh, he initially starts off Team Black because basically he's in love with Rhaenyra. He offers her an opportunity to escape. What do you think of that, particularly, uh, Hillary? Do you think that was, like, like uh, a good thing or a bad thing? But that he was um, on the side of the Blacks? Or that no, he that, that basically his, his solution for Rhaenyra's illegitimate sort of affair t- type deal is, hey, let's escape to Essos, you know, uh, and we can uh, give up all of our trappings and go live as, uh, you know, more common folk or whatever. Um, I think it's really an interesting facet of Cole's character because you act, what have you said something about uh, him being a part of the system that that's the difference between between him being a thug and him being a knight is that he's a part of the system and I think in a weird way I think he's kind of like a very fairy tale romantic person mm-hmm. um, because obviously his interpretation of his relationship with Rhaenyra is much more romantic for him than it is for her. Um, and hmm. the idea of, oh, let's, like, take off and just ride off into the sunset together and um, have marriage like normal people um, is seems to be a pretty obvious element of maybe that sort of way that he embraces the fantasy of chivalry and, like, medieval life. And Rhaenyra is sort of the one who breaks that for him. Yeah, because uh, obviously, I think one of the issues here is that, like, Rhaenyra is obviously inexperienced when it comes to uh, romances and things like that. So, it, you know, it's it's not clear that uh, exactly what it is that she wants from this relationship, other than the fact that she just kind of wants maybe some freedom. Uh, you know, she wants some joy uh, from her regimented... Uh, God forbid. You know, 
Yeah. <laughs> God, for, God forbid, you know, you let a teenager, uh, although, you know... Bang well, her, like her the, way older bodyguard. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, it is a bit, it is a bit suspicious. <laughs> but there is a uh, weird power dynamic because, yeah, Kristen is way bigger and can quite literally cut her in half. But also, she's his boss, and if she says so, they will kill him. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's actually really interesting because... A lot of people do act as if Cole is completely predatory, but the very fact that like the power relationship between him and her is ostensibly one of master and slave, uh, I, d I do think that changes everything, right? Like, uh, don't don't you don't you think? And and like yeah. uh, Hillary said, Cole is in the fantasy. He it, so and in the fantasy, being king, being queen, that is absolute. That is that is top of the chain. They have all of the power. He cannot say no because of what he has, like, chained himself to ideologically. Right. And I think, and it's interesting that you say that Rhaenyra is obviously inexperienced with relationships because I assume, despite the fact that Cole is a lot older than her, he probably is too. Like, if he is so devoted to this system that he managed to work his way up from the bottom to the top, he probably hasn't stepped out of line from that like ever so being put in a position where he is starting a relationship with someone that is illicit and sort of obviously breaks the rules but is something that he can't really say no to is a very uh complex element of his characterization man it's yeah. so it's so nice to be able to talk about the dragon show again and it's just like good <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> it's it's like there's good characters like Kristen Cole is both trying to assuade his guilt with this marriage proposal and also because he believes in romance and also because if they catch him he'll lose everything and also he's obsessed with legacy and 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 it's so good. Why wasn't it, it like it, this? I wouldn't consider how few how little screen time all of the characters have gotten the man the fact that they've managed to embed so many different facets of their personalities is pretty impressive yeah they, they did an amazing job with the season and the way it ends is fantastic i cannot wait to see what they do next but let's rush back to uh kristen cole so named because of all the fire that's happening everywhere <laughs> yeah so after he after he basically has his falling out with, with Rhaenyra, he basically falls in with, with Alicent and essentially kind of becomes a pawn against Rhaenyra because I think the implication is that Alicent will protect him uh, from any fallout, provided he does uh, what she says, and he becomes very quickly loyal to her, right? Yeah. I was actually kind of surprised by just how quickly he just flipped the script. Uh, and some people talk about it like, oh, he's trying to get back his ex. But I, I do think there must be something a little bit more deeper there, you know? Yeah, because you think he'd be less trusting. But I, I think it's also because uh, he he uh, confessed to Allison and then Allison caught him committing seppuku, I guess, in in right. the in the heart garden. Um, and and then he the just. Would, yeah. I, I think it's a moment of like he was incredibly vulnerable. And she offered him an out. Mm. Because he, again, he is obsessed with legacy. One, one of the big things is that uh, he needed to leave so that he didn't stain his honor. Because this is all he has. This is all people will remember him for. She is giving him an opportunity to be remembered for more than just screwing up, basically. Right. Yeah, I find it interesting that you use the word pawn to describe him in terms of like the what role he plays for the Greens. Because I actually think that one of the reasons that he likes Allison so much is that she does treat him with respect, especially like when you consider that she is the queen. For her to be so like reliant and trusting towards someone like him is a pretty big deal. Uh, and I think that that obviously, I think that that's genuine. I don't think that's her attempting to manipulate him either. But it's obvious that like that kind of feeling would make him much easier to manipulate. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's also very uh, evident in how Allison and Rhaenyra rule differently because Rhaenyra is very much like headstrong. What I say goes, I know what's right. But Allison does actually consult with people. She rules by counsel, whereas uh 
Rhaenyra rules kind of a little bit more dictatorially. And I think Kristen, when he was on Rhaenyra's side, like you said, was almost snubbed opinion wise. Like, like how many times did Rhaenyra ask for Kristen's opinion on something? But Alicent right. helps, like, like lets him do stuff. When they have to find Aegon to crown him, she sends Kristen over everyone. I right. think it, it, it's that level of respect. Well, she does also send Aemon. Well, no, Aemon right. volunteers to go. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. she he... sends Kristen, but Aemon volunteers to help. Yeah, because um, Aemon wants to convince Kristen to uh, forget about Aegon and put him on the throne instead. Yeah, there is that, uh, there is that interesting moment, uh, to just to go back about like the co- concept of him being a thug, because I believe in that scene, Aemon... And uh, Kristen are struggling to look for Aegon, and he's a bit of a, a lech, and uh, he's quite debauched. And they're like, "Oh, you know, right. we are we we don't have a, a taste for." Uh, yes. Oh, that yeah, wonderful scene, that scene, men of our stature. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because on the one hand, I kind of agree. Cole doesn't strike me as the kind of person who would just like casually go to a brothel, but on the other hand, I'm pretty sure he just beat a man to death <laughs> right. in, in, in the previous seat. So it's like. It's it's kind of weird how there is this dichotomy between like uh, violence and like uh, I, I guess yeah yeah you know it's like oh yeah beating a man to death you know that's fine uh, going to a, a brothel and souring some illegitimate kids that's also you know that's not fine yeah uh, <laughs> I do want to say uh, very interestingly uh, mm-hmm. the whole Jeffrey uh, Joffrey Lonmouth thing in the books mm-hmm. that's an accident almost well it's not right necessarily an accident but it, it could be considered one because he cracks joffrey's head or his helmet during a tournament and then joffrey mm-hmm. dies from it like six days later whereas in the show it is very direct mm-hmm. and it, yeah it, that was kind of an odd uh switch up but i i'm guessing i mean i can understand why they made the change in terms of like narrative convenience and it's obviously way like less expensive to film two people fighting in a room <laughs> than setting up an entire uh tournament, tournament to yeah. kill off joffrey but yeah. Oh. yeah it is kind of funny uh you know in terms of like what they can actually do because this is still live action uh i kind of almost just as a this brief discussion, you know, the tangent. I kind of wish we had gotten like an animated version of this, uh, because they could do way more crazy things. Like a like nightmare an of the wolf kind of deal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like an animated uh version of the show, because they could show like so many more things. Because, you know, there are limits to practical effects, and I love practical effects, but you know, I'm sometimes I feel like there is a disconnection between like what Martin is writing and what you actually can see on the screen, if that makes sense. I don't know. I, I feel like <laughs> I love animation. Don't get me wrong. It's it's my favorite medium ever. I just think that one of the things that adds to the show so well is how realistic everything is. And that's why like the dragons feel so much weightier as a mm. uh an a thing, as a as a set piece in this world, because they are so different. You know, you, mm. you have these incredible stone walls and they're live action, so they look solid, they look powerful, and then you have this monstrosity just destroy them, and it makes you feel, I think, what the character is supposed to feel of this, like, unending dread that at the hands of these crazy people and their stupid metal chairs and their big lizards, we could all die in a moment. Right. Mm. Yeah, okay. <laughs> to bring it back a little bit, uh, so in terms of, okay, I think we've basically got a summary of Kristen Cole, because in terms of like where he goes, he starts off as a lowly knight, he defeats uh, Damon, he becomes a king's god, and then he gradually, slowly but surely works his way into the upper echelon of like the team well, green power structure. I, I don't remember if they did in the show, did he become Lord Commander? Because it's around this period of time where he does become Lord Commander of the King's Guard. Yes, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in the show, Harold Westerling is ordered to go kill Rhaenyra at, like, uh And then he Dragonstone. just dips. He, he barristers. He's, like, he's like, there's no king, I'm, you know, uh, no commander of a king's guard if there's no king, and then he bails. And then, all right, Christian, you're in charge of the king's guard, I guess. Yeah, gang gang, <laughs> kill an old man. <laughs> yeah. He just, um, oh, the way he kills Beesbury is rough. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like... 
<laughs> you know, there is this idea that like Kristen and Amon are more like honorable men, uh, contrasting against like Aegon and some of the others. But there's a darkness in him. Yeah, like you, there's a real darkness in him. You slammed um, a, an old man into a marble this morning, and he died. <laughs> And he's very strong. Like to do that to kill somebody, you have to be really, really strong to just like smack somebody around, you know? Yeah, and then Mushroom it's it's weird though, because like in this case, Mushroom says that he threw Beesbury from the window. <laughs> so it's it's still weird. So I, I guess the legacy he leaves behind is that he is very like puritanical. So when it comes to things like being seduced and stuff, he never would. But when it do comes to he- violence, fuck yeah. Well, I okay, Hillary. What what do you think? Oh, um, I actually did a video like about Kristen and Allison, and this obviously is a sort of key moment for their relationship. And my take on that is sort way more sort of emotionally driven, um, mm-hmm. because obviously Beesbury is directly or indirectly um, accusing Allison of regicide, which is an extremely uh, the highest of treasons, literally, yeah. right? Um, yeah. So, from Kristen's perspective, obviously, Allison is, like, one of the only people that he actually cares about in the world. Um, She is someone who saved his life and has continually saved it by never outing him for also committing treason, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So, to see her in that position and to know, like, to have witnessed her being mistreated and basically abused by Viserys for their entire relationship and then... To see some jackass be like, oh, well, maybe you killed this ancient man who was obviously on the verge of death for years beforehand Mm -hmm. anyway. Um, I think it was probably a very emotional reaction for him because he sees Allison as such an upstanding person who wouldn't do that. And someone is essentially threatening her life in front of him um so i think that probably made him react like a crazy person i 100 percent agree and i think violence is the only way that Kristen can deal with these sort of situations and i'm gonna just call me a cat because i'm gonna do a big stretch here um i think what Kristen cole is in house of the dragon is what gray worm should have ended up being in Game of Thrones. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> All right. Justify that position, my guy. <laughs> because both of them are characters that are built on the fact that all they know, all they're good at, is war, is fighting and killing and destroying things. And they are put in positions of leadership and not quite governance in Kristen's position, but like influence. And and these are violent people who have earned their place in life through violence, and now they are potentially the leaders of others, and and not just in violent situations. A lot of the king's guard is ceremonial shit. You know, they have to protect the king, but they just have to most of the time like do marches and things. They're they're not like actually on the front lines all the time. And the the unsullied right. might be a, a different situation, but. Grey Worm's a commander. He's not going to be on the front line, or he shouldn't be at least. That's not how you run an army. I actually think there's an interesting connection there, too, in that obviously Grey Worm has experienced much more extreme trauma, but that both Kristen and Grey Worm, um, well, that Kristen's sort of erratic behavior, I think, is largely driven by unresolved trauma. And I think Game of Thrones would have made a lot more sense if they addressed that with the Unsullied, that you're talking about, you know, literally thousands of men who have been, their entire lives have been trauma after trauma after trauma. So for them, Grey Worm to sort of only really lose his shit after Masande dies doesn't really make that much sense, given that he has so much horrific shit to unpack. Yeah, and also, then he does nothing about it. Like, he, he just lets Jon Snow walk free when they when a bunch of people from a different country tell him it's cool. And also, then he takes all of the Unsullied to go and die from the butterfly, butterfly disease on, on right. Missandei's planet, on, on her planet, on her, on her um, island. But yeah. <laughs> the, I, I do, look, I, I, 
I might need you guys to gather some shiny pieces of tinfoil about this because I have a theory. <laughs> um, I think Kristen Cole is Dornish, or, or like from Dornish heritage, and I think that caused a lot of abuse in his childhood because he grew up in Blackhaven, which is on the Dornish marshes, which probably not crazy keen to have Dornish-ish kids running around. So I think he was probably, he probably got beat up a lot. I think he got like ostracized a lot. And I think that most likely the Dornish part is on his mother's side, which one could imply that his mother either isn't in the picture anymore or also receives a similar treatment. And two could explain why he has so many unresolved feelings towards um, his, like how people perceive him, but also his relationship to women. Because in his in his mind as a child, you know, you're you're not thinking like, oh, this is just like a societal thing that that people do. It's shitty. He's thinking like, it is your fault that I look like this, and that's why I'm getting mistreated. So I think that if, if we got a small expanded universe, as it were, on whether or not Kristen Cole is actually Dornish, it could bring up a lot of childhood traumas that contribute to his relationships to women and violence today. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> you dropped that one on us. Uh, Hillary, what do you think? I have some thoughts. Um, I think it's interesting because um, obviously the portrayal of Kristen in the books versus in the show is slightly different. Or, well, we don't really know that much about Kristen's heritage or how he grew up in Fire and Blood. Whereas, as you pointed out before... Um, they literally state that he's Dornish in House of the Dragon. So I think at least within House of the Dragon, they are obviously trying to incorporate sort of a shade of racism to their whole dynamic. Um, and I think, so I think, I don't necessarily, I think that the mother aspect that you're incorporating into the theory is is the more tinfoily <laughs> idea to me. But um but in general, I can sort of see where you're going and that that makes sense to me that aside, in addition to him being sort of a lower born person, being Dornish or partially Dornish also leads him to be more isolated and disrespected in Westeros in general. It's it's interesting to me because it seems like in general, I think we talked about this when you talked about like the feminism episode, which if you guys haven't seen it, you should you should check it out. But yeah, where is it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we show up briefly. So uh, there is a spectrum of male archetypes, in my opinion, in Game of Thrones, and you have basically in my in 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 my assessment two types of guys. You have strong but dumb, or weak but clever. <laughs> like <laughs> so, on, on the one hand, you have someone like Jon Snow, who in the show at least is very strong he's very brave but he's not very clever in terms of like he always gets outmaneuvered by uh if you word that right it could be a million dollar catchphrase <laughs> he's, he's like a himbo you know he's like a westerosi yeah. himbo <laughs> right <laughs> and then you have a character like uh, peter baelish who is weak and you know he gets beat the fact that he gets beaten up in a duel is like a, a thing that he uh, that hangs over him for like the rest of his life basically but he's clever and scheming and well that's basically the I mean, he almost <laughs> died. That, yeah, like, he, that near-death experience you have is going to hang over you for a while. Yeah, but like lots of people almost die, and it doesn't you know, affect them as, as much. The fact that he doesn't tend to get into many more fights, I think is quite, you know, it, it's the point, right? Kristen Cole, yeah. in my mind, is very much on the, on the strong but dumb side <laughs> of the spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> And I think this issue about, like, the fact that he only knows how to fight is because that's what's expected of him, right? He's only ever expected to have been a, a warrior because he's strong. If he wasn't strong, then, you know, he would be more like a creepy Laris type, which I guess we have to have a, a separate discussion about, like, why those two male archetypes in particular. Because I feel like there are maybe, there are also female archetypes, but... You know, I think there's a little bit more diversity there, whereas all the men are basically either strong but dumb or weak but smart. Well, uh, I think it's because even though uh, medieval culture does give a lot more 
freedom, quote unquote, to men, it is also incredibly more restrictive in that you, you have to be, you have to contribute in some way. And if you can't fight, if you can't contribute physically, you have to contribute mentally. Mm. But I would Who say, is, is Ned Stark dumb but and, and strong? Yeah. Yeah, he's yes. not good politically. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's, he's... Um, but he's a good right. lord. No, but he, he's, he's good at governing his own a... lands. One of the most interesting aspects of like the Ned's role in the story is that a lot of times when you read from Kat's point of view, she is like running circles around him in terms of politics, and she literally like thinks like, oh, I have to wait for Ned to actually figure this out. Oh. Um, so, and I mean, Kat is, you know, a somewhat smart person, but the fact that she she's sort of always like, eh, well, I'll, I'll just wait for Ned to come around on this and understand where I'm coming from or what needs to be done or whatever. Um, okay, wait, wait, so, wait, yeah, wait. You're on. What? You're on Greyjoy. Strong and smart. Well, uh, I wouldn't say he's that smart. No, I wouldn't. He's like creepy. He's he's like he's crafty, but I wouldn't necessarily say he's smart because a lot of his plans are completely just unhinged. Okay, but then right? we have to define intelligence. Okay, so what I what I mean? Okay, <laughs> do you mean book smart or do you mean street smart? Because I can bring up Bron. Bron literally wins a fight through tactics over a much more heavily armored opponent. That's smart. Mm. Okay, so Hillary, I think you you get what I mean when I say like dumb but strong. So Don't what, gang what I mean, up on me. <laughs> Explain yourself, I, man. Uh, yeah, what I mean is that when you have a strong but dumb character, basically this character is good at at emphasizing their masculinity in the way that masculinity is meant to be emphasized, right? So when you talk about like Bron being a good fighter, being a good fighter is still a masculine thing. The fact that he used his brain to out tactics that fighter guy is an example of like good fighting but when we talk about like the weak but smart characters they don't fight at all they can't fight like the various types oh okay they so can't... what you're saying is that the characters are either like hyper masculine or subverting masculinity yes well not yeah, subverting Chris... necessarily because there, there's still a lot of like toxic max masculinity on display they're just a, an anti-masculine trope yeah, well, I, I I would argue that Kristen Cole is like a complicated representation of like toxic masculinity because he is that guy. He only solves problems with his fists, but you know he does have a lot of positive traits as well. He's incredibly loyal once he's loyal to you, right? I, I genuinely feel like if Alison told him to take a dive, he would take a dive. Um, <laughs> he, he's and, almost crusader-like. Yeah, he is almost crusader-like, and it, it's really interesting because uh, he is both kind of toxic but also he's like the only way that he's ever known how to live and I, I feel like that causes a lot of conflict for people you know in how to assess him because i think lots of people especially you know hillary you've made this point several times lots of people want the show to be cut and dry but it never will be yes yeah it's very intentionally designed so it can't be cut and dry so the fact that so many people uh try to make it that way or act as if it is that way is very uh, strange do you, yeah. <laughs> do you guys think that's why we latch on to, to characters like Laris, who's very obviously meant to be, like, evil? Because he is kind of a cut and dry, like, this dude's sketchy kind of character? I think I was more interested in Laris before he did the whole, like... Feet uh, thing? Let me see your feet. Yeah, the feet thing really <laughs> pulled me out of it. <laughs> uh, have you seen that meme where it's someone staring at House of the Dragons like, wow, legitimacy and medieval houses is a lot more complicated and the message going over their head is foot fetishes are always evil. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I think it's... um. I think it's why George throws in characters like like Laris and Ramsay and Joffrey and stuff. It, these uh, way more evil characters, so that the the ones who are still evil but can be redeemed look less uh, cut and dry. They they look more complicated in comparison. Yeah, I think um, I I don't know about you, Hillary, but I I feel like a character. It's hard to add moral nuance in a world where everything is, like, by default gray, you know? Like, I think one of the things that Game of Thrones is specifically designed as is a reaction to stuff like Lord of the Rings and also, you know, some other 
uh, fantasy things. And so you often have characters who are just like kind of wacky, but George is also a little bit of a wacky writer. The fact that there's like half human animal hybrids that just keep showing up in the story is always weird. <laughs> you know, it, yeah, it, that's like, weird. It feels like the fact that he would just give Laris like a foot fetish thing, which is like is a thing that he would do, you know? But he, he it like, makes sense. You can see how that comes to it because Laris is club footed. Yeah. So I don't think that's in the book, though. Am I? No, no. His his nickname is the Clubfoot. That? Oh, I mean, oh, f- I don't think his foot fetish is in the books. Oh, probably not. But I don't think Laris features greatly in the books uh, to begin with. Yeah. Um. Well, no. So I I guess my point is is that um that could have just been a show invention because that does seem very. I mean, I HBO. guess it could be <laughs> what. It does seem very HBO. <laughs> yeah. Although, I, yeah, again, I, I can't see how you would get there, because, like, Laris is very obviously kind of almost narcissistic, but obviously has body image issues because he is club-footed, and he sees people walking around with, like, their perfect feet... And he's got, like, this Giga Chad ultra brain, and he's like, you're so much dumber than me, but you're respected more because your feet are normal. I'm gonna make you feel bad about them. This is actually something that I wanted to ask you guys. So, like, obviously there are complicated dynamics at play. Like, Laris is doing this thing with Allison. Clearly, I don't per se think it's, like, a purely sexual thing. I think he wants to do it because he has power over. Something that I find interesting about Kristen is that you never really see Kristen like, think of Alicent as anything other than, like, his, like, you know, his uh, uh, boss, in a way. Like, it, you never get the sense that, like, oh, yeah, they would hook up if, you know, uh, that was even on the table. I just think that's really interesting, because normally, you know, it, it's very rare to see a relationship between a man and a woman who aren't related to each other also not be, like, have those undertones. You, yeah. you get what I'm saying? In television, not in yeah. real life. Um, to me, interestingly, I do see, read sort of a romantic undertone to them, especially in terms of, like, it seems like Kristen really fulfills the role that Viserys should have fulfilled for all mm-hmm. of the Greens, really. Um, he sort of acts like Allison's partner and has a very, like, paternal uh, role for the children in a way that is, like... It's not something you might would necessarily pick up on on the first viewing because you can sort of you can see the familial dynamics. But when you consider the fact that like, oh, like Aegon will actually do what Kristen tells him to do, despite the fact that he is the heir to the throne in the eyes of many. And Kristen is like his king's guard is really, like you said, supposed to be his servant or slave or whatever. So the fact that um Aemon and Aegon, and even Helena, um, sort of defer to him or seem to have a personal relationship with him is a really interesting facet of his characterization as a whole. Um, But I think that because he and Allison are both very sort of like rule followers, Mm. even if they have a romantic interest in each other, they it's a complete non issue because they both actually do abide by the rules of the society that they live in. It, yeah. It's almost I, I, like a Lancelot courtly love kind of situation. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna actually ask about that because I think one interesting thing about Kristen Cole and Alicent and the fact that like for for some reason it should be completely obvious, but they are both incredibly like rules followers. You know, that's like a core part of their characters that they believe in the rules of the system. And they um you know adopt they, they they like really work within the system and sometimes they don't necessarily like it, but you don't they don't you don't have that position of them as like outside rebels in the same way that you do like with Renera or Daemon. Yeah. I do I do wanna bring up I might be reading a bit too much into this, but I do think it's interesting that um even though they, they trust each other so much, um whenever Alicent has to uh reprimand Aegon Kristen is never in the room. I, I, I had to even notice that. I, I think it's kind of interesting because it's clearly meant to be, you know, like this is a private thing where no one can see how terrible Aegon actually is and no one can see uh, Aegon's mother talking down to him because he could be king one day. 
but it, it, it's just interesting to me that Kristen isn't a part of that because you're right he does have like a paternal kind of influence there it is it is interesting because he did teach the boys how to fight right in a yeah. in a medieval context generally there's quite a strong relationship between like the son or not the son but like younger boys who learn how to fight from older uh more experienced knights that is you know in in like our modern context we'd expect like the father to teach the son but obviously in you know in real life uh, kings would have had their um uh instructors teach their kids but it is interesting that it's Kristen who does it specifically even though he you know he could fob this off to someone else (laughs) yeah he is kind of too this is below his pay grade he's literally the queen's sworn shield yeah, yet he still takes his time out of his day to teach her uh, her children how to fight, which is like a very specific kind of thing. And, you know, <laughs> maybe it's a pride thing because he's also like his fighting is his only real like positive skill. But I, I do think that is interesting because, you know, that also endears him a lot to someone like uh, Amon, who is also, you know, in that kind of mold of a, a fighter. Um, yeah. Oh, wait, I do want to... Well- Sorry, oh, yep. I I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, there's there is a delicious little bit of a uh, <laughs> I don't even know what it is. It's like dissing or something that happens in the books. Uh, mm-hmm. Is that at basically every tournament that happens, Kristen rides with um, Rhaenyra's favor until he spurns her or she spurns him about running away to Dawn. Oh, or not Dawn, sorry, uh, running away to one of the free cities and becoming a soul sword and whatever. And then in the very next tournament, which happens like a year later, he rides with Alicent's favor. And it's this pure moment of like, absolute medieval <gasps> It's so good! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is, you know, there are a couple of moments that the show will, will definitely have like that. Uh, what were you going to uh, uh, say, um, Hillary? Oh, um, regarding, like, the way that... Uh, I find the way that Kristen teaches the kids to fight to be very interesting. Because obviously we can see in his dynamic with the strong boys and Harwin Strong that he's teaching them to fight. Like, he's not teaching... And we can see that effect with Amund when he literally says, I don't give a shit about tourneys. You know what I mean? That mm. he is there knowing that he is prepared. And I assume that's probably why he took a special interest in them and sort and did sort of go below his pay grade because he did understand like, oh, these children's lives are going to be in danger at some point. So mm-hmm. I need to teach them how to actually survive. It's not just about like, oh, I'm teaching you a skill. It's like, no, this is something that you're going to need to know for the future. And I'm going to give you like every advantage that I can in terms of what my knowledge base is. And it's also, you, you can kind of see how they fight, like, their, their specific styles. Like, Aegon and, and stuff are clearly a lot more, not angry, but it's like they're using anger a lot more. They do a lot of screaming and a lot of heavy hits and stuff, and the strong boys are a lot more, like, defensive and things when they're fighting. And it, it does feel like the, the uh, greens of using uh, Kristen's style of, like, channeling all of your anger into fighting. Right, and they're not afraid to be sort of brutal. Like, in the, um... Well, it's interesting, too. So, when we're looking at, for instance, the dinner scene with the greens and the blacks all together... That's one of my favorite um, scenes. It's so good. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. It's a fantastic one. So, we can see a lot about the black boys versus the green boys in that entire scene to begin with. Like, we see, um, obviously, Eamon and Jace, their fight is sort of the primary... Uh, no, it's... The Lu- primary it, focus. It's Eamon and Luke, isn't it? No, Eamon... No, Eamon and Jace are the ones who fight each other in... Um, during the dinner. But we can see, like... <laughs> For instance, that Jace, like, hits Aemon in the face and he doesn't even react. He just laughs, laughs, which, um, again, shows you, like, he must have been taught really, he must have been taught much more than t- techniques about fighting because he knows how to take a hit. And then, similarly, we see 
Luke goes to try and help Jace when the fight starts, and then Aemon and then Aegon grabs him and just like slams his head into the table. Um, which yeah. in a normal situation, you'd be like, "Oh my god, you look at this! He's an adult man, like assaulting a child, basically," which is insane. But again, goes to show that Cole probably taught them like. If you're gonna like, if you're gonna fight, you don't have to worry about fighting fair. You have to worry about winning. Yeah, it's also interesting that like immediately, despite the fact that Amon and Aegon don't like each other, they instantly like click into like a yeah. the, the united front immediately yeah. without even saying anything. They both imme- Aegon takes down uh, the other strong boy, and Amon. You know, they it's like it, the, that kind of stuff is probably taught to them by both Alicent and Cole, right? In the sense yeah. of like. As a family, you've got to stick together, but also as like a military unit, you've got to like instantly stick together, you know. Um, uh, even though they don't like each other. Not to not to keep harping on the the whole book point, but it, it is interesting that we we have the show and it's been sort of like revealed to be canonically exactly what happened uh, objectively, because the the book now acts as sort of like what everyone thinks happened, and apparently in the books. Yeah, it, it's like Eustace, Septon Eustace believed that uh, Kristen Cole was the one who told Aegon Rhaenyra would kill him and his siblings if he didn't take the throne and fight her. Mm. And I, I believe in the show it's um, Alicent that tells Aegon that. Mm. And yeah, she says that he is the challenge to her reign. Yeah. Really. And... and so it it becomes this thing of like everyone perceives that a heavy truth like that would have been given by Kristen Cole, which is weird for your mom's bodyguard to be giving you hard truths like this. Yeah. So even even in the perception of the masses, people kind of understood Kristen Cole is essentially a part of this family. And he gets named Kristen the Kingmaker after he puts the crown on Aegon's head. Right. <laughs> you know, because Viserys wasn't exactly the best father figure. Uh, to say the least. To say the least, yeah. That's like an <laughs> understatement of the year. So it is interesting that, like, in terms of the Team Green, Kristen Cole is kind of like a, the patriarch. He's the male figure that uh, has the strongest influence on the rest of the, the boys. Whereas Daemon is that in the <coughs> on Team Black. Yeah. Uh, and, well, you uh, know what I find yeah. a little interesting about that, though, is that it doesn't seem like Daemon has a close relationship with the strong boys, strong boys whatsoever. Yeah. Um, like, they don't appear to have much of a relationship, which is weird when you consider, like, that they've been on an island isolated together and this is their stepdad. But it, versus, it, like... You have that scene with um, Kristen and Eamon um, talking about, like, very personal things about mm. where, and again, when you consider the way that they've characterized Eamon, where he doesn't seem to have, like, much of a personal relationship with anyone, for him to be, like, opening up in such a vulnerable way and basically, like, sharing, you know, his greatest desires and his greatest traumas and then for Kristen to be giving him advice and sort of you know um guiding him in that way it was a really really uh, great example of how much of a paternal role Kristen seems to have taken with all of Allison's children yeah it is it is super unusual that he is that father figure he is that paternal role he doesn't they're not his children but by virtue of his devotion to Allison they kind of have become you know um yeah. And uh, yeah, I guess Game of Thrones does have, a, a, in general, A Song of Ice and Fire has a lot to talk about, like fatherhood. You know, you were talking uh, in your video about like why the proposal between uh, um, Lucerus and uh, <coughs> what's your name between Thank you. Jason and Helena. Yeah, between Jason and Helena. Whoops, sorry. between Jason and Helena is not a good idea. It's like parenthood is a very complicated thing in this series. And it's, like, not easy for people to be parents. Parents are very flawed in this setting. And oftentimes, you don't really get to choose your parents. And, uh, you know, sometimes you have these big blended families because of all this crazy nobility. But it is really interesting to me that a guy who's so far removed from, like, what you would think of as the center of politics 
ended up being at like the dead center of the most important political event in almost the history of Westeros, at least the history of Westeros to this point, you know? You gotta stab just, the right yeah. people, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, another thing that I wish I had caught that I only noticed because someone else pointed it out, and I think I really hope that it was an intentional choice because it really, again, illustrates Kristen's, Cole as a f Kristen's role as a family member within the Greens, is um, during the coronation when uh, Rainey's busts in on Maylie's and, you know, it's all chaos or whatever, and yeah. the entire family standing there, um, Allison tells Cole to go get Helena and she puts herself in front of um, Eamon. She puts herself between Eamon and Maylie's. And when Cole goes to get Helena, um, she like holds on to his arm like she's afraid or like bracing herself for what's about to happen. So mm -hmm. when they've established her as basically a neurodivergent coded character who doesn't like being touched by anyone, the fact that she would grab Kristen in like a comforting, fearful way really illustrates that he must have a deep personal relationship with all of them that obviously goes beyond just training them to fight because he wouldn't have trained Helena to fight at all. Yeah. Um, I so for him love this. What? Go ahead. I never actually <laughs> wow, I never actually noticed that. <laughs> that is so I good. I, somebody else mentioned it and I was like, oh my God, that is actually so good and does again give so much more depth to Kristen's role in the Greens in general and makes it so much more than a political uh connection man i love the that the dragon show is good again <laughs> yeah <laughs> so do i i i do want to say it feels very weirdly kind of like the greens are a lot more of a messed up family but at the same time more of like a unified family mm -hmm. the blacks seem kind of like a lot more open with each other but at the same time, a lot less, like, connected. Because I, I got the impression that, like, Jace and Luke are on the same side, but they don't seem to be on the same side as Damon and Rhaenyra. Right. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's weird. I would weird. tend to agree with that. I sort of, I mean, one of the things that I sort of like about the Greens in, like, a weird way is that nobody likes them. Like, within, canonically within the world itself. Um, like, they don't seem to have any friends. They don't seem to have, you know connections outside of each other so they do sort of have that vibe of like we're all we have so even if we are mad at each other or hate each other or are completely different people we're still going to have each other's backs because nobody else is going to yeah i do oh wait i actually came up with something that i wouldn't say a bit early in the video if this story had been changed a bit Kristen cole would have been the main character because he is a, oh, yeah. a basically a lowborn that gets raised up to one of the most powerful knights in the world, falls in love with a princess, gets betrayed, and then helps uh, coronate a king. Like, if they had changed the tone of it a bit more, he would have been the main character in his own personal anime. And I think it's amazing that he isn't. Like, it's awesome that he is so much more complicated than that. It's it's a great. I think that's a really good point because he does he does fit into almost exactly that sort of fantasy protagonist archetype. Yeah, it it, it says a lot about the writing of House of the Dragon, and also maybe in particular the type of conflict that we're dealing with. That we can have so many of these characters who, in any other context, would be the main character, but here they're just like a side character. Because in the books, Kristen right. Cole is really not like talked about, um, and his role, in in my opinion, has really been elevated in the show. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they, they could have very easily just like left him in the background, but I think they made a deliberate choice to add uh, more stuff because obviously a TV show is different from a book. Yeah, um, yeah. But I, I think the, the the reason George made characters like this because you have characters like like Kristen Cole and Amond and everything who could have been some of the most influential people of an age if they were all born in different ages. I think. He included them all in this like melting pot of Targa uh, uh, Targaryen. Uh, what's the word here? Uh, Aeos. <laughs> like, oh god, power. I guess where where they're at their height of their power. Uh, he he puts them in this situation where all of these people who could have been so powerfully influential in the world suddenly have to clash against each other because there are these huge personalities. And then you have people like Aemond, who has a literal fucking sapphire in his eye, 
and <laughs> and rides the biggest dragon in the world and could have also totally been a main character uh he might die you've got da- i don't know actually if he does uh you've got damon who wields a magic sword and started the city guard he might die you've got Kristen cole who came from nothing he might die allison who married into this family but truly cares about the her own family and the the country she might die it's it's like they it's like george wrote down 15 interesting characters and it's like how do i get them to kill each other yeah <laughs> Well, and that is the point, right? The ultimate point of the Dance of the Dragons is that it's completely wasteful and pointless, and it basically destroys the uh, regime. It's the death of the regime, and it's like a slow death because, you know, they will struggle to maintain themselves. And yeah, you're right. Like, so many of the people who could have been the most influential leaders of Westerosi history are going to all, you know, uh, destroy each other because of basically a family squall <laughs> yeah well, and what also makes it kind of awesome is that like they're gonna destroy each other because of one crappy king like, yeah. they're, gonna, they're gonna all of these super extraordinary or like these sort of fantasy character archetypes are all going to destroy each other because viserys just like wasn't very good at his job it's not yeah, even yeah. that it's the, it, it's literally just because viserys couldn't stick to a decision right (laughs) yeah yeah. i have to ask because we do have to wrap up uh soon but uh maybe two two final questions uh so first first question and following on callum's tangent uh do you think it would have like the dance would have happened if viserys had just said either way she's not my heir or she is my heir and just had like done it decisively it would it wouldn't have happened at this point would it no i think it would have because viserys basically did he basically said, like, no, Rhaenyra's my heir, that's the end of it. And then Alison misinterpreted his prophetic Aegon dream for a deathbed confession. Mm. And uh, Hillary, what do you think? Um, yeah, I think that the the dance was an inevitability because the all of the green boys were going to pose a challenge to Rhaenyra forever, no matter what. Um, and I wish they hadn't incorporated Allison overhearing the uh, prophecy or whatever, because uh, I feel like it's sort of it, it gave them an out that they really didn't need. I feel mm, like it does cheapen are, it. Yeah, and they're pretty. I mean, not necessarily that they're justified, but their decisions are completely understandable solely from the point of view of of if they don't fight Rhaenyra, they will die. Yeah, I mean, we had that whole thing in the first episode about like. Everyone is hungry for a war. So it, it, it does feel... I've, I've never been super keen on the whole Aegon prophecy stuff from the first episode. I, I just personally think that it, it, it feels like a, a tissue-thin connection to the original show. But I didn't mind it so much. But in that moment, I was kind of like, ugh, I wish they hadn't done this. I wish it had been a conscious decision on, like, uh, it had been a choice that people had made. There was no justification other than, you know, this is what I believe. Right. Mm. Yeah, I would tend to agree. I, like, there are certain elements of the prophecy that I sort of like, but um, but yeah, I feel like I agree that it was just sort of something that they put in there to connect it to Game of Thrones. Yeah, I, I, I think so as well. That's one of the, like, one of the pros and cons of this type of work is that everything is connected and everything also has to connect, you know, at least into some... some some sense, you know. I, I kind of wish that maybe House of the Dragon come first. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> just because from a storytelling perspective, I feel like it'd be cleaner. Uh, we wouldn't have to worry as much about, like, future events. But, you know, that, 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 that is how it is. So, final question. Uh, what do you think of the actual actor, Franz Frankel, uh, in Fabian. terms of his portrayal? Sorry, F- Franz <laughs> Frankel. <laughs> no. Franz Ferdinand. Uh, what do you think yeah. of him? <laughs> Um, so what, I, do you, what do you think of Fabian uh, as the actual actor? Do you think he does a good job as being Kristen? In your mind, having read the books, do you think that's a good portrayal or a bad portrayal? Because people love uh, Ewan, Ewan Mitchell as uh, Amon and uh, Matt Smith as uh, Damon and you know so on and so forth. And um, yeah, I really like him. I feel like he elevates the character a lot. 
um, which is always like the best thing that an actor can do for a character. If you take a character from the page and you make that character better in some way, I feel like that is the ultimate goal of actors to bring something else to the table. I feel like he brings a lot to the table. I wasn't super interested in Kristen before the show started, um, but the way in which Fabian managed to make his character emotionally resonant uh, made him into one of my favorite characters on the show. Mm. I, I don't think there is a single bad actor in House of the Dragon. I can't think of one. I mean, I can think of the best ones. Paddy Constantine is going to like be at the top of that list for a long time. His portrayal of Viserys was incredible, but Fabian does an incredible job as well. I, I think it's, it's just a very well done show in so many departments, and the acting is stellar across the board. Yeah, I, I tend to agree, especially with you, Hillary, because like Kristen Cole was never a main character I was super interested in. But I, I think, uh, you know, you bring this up when you with your video with uh, um, Tywin, where like a good a good actor can like really fundamentally change the perception of a character. Like uh, Charles Dance makes Tywin Lannister like a big brain mega genius when really if you look at the text yes. he's actually kind of a, a jackass <laughs> he's just a right. weirdo yeah. beard dad yeah he's kind of he's kind of a, an idiot <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, i would agree with that obviously obviously i would yeah. agree with that because oh, i said yeah. that in a video i i thought of something today oh this just like fired up a f bunch of neurons that are still kicking around up there somehow but i was thinking today Tywin's the one who says, like, the lion doesn't concern himself with the opinions of the sheep, right? Which basically means, like, who gives a shit what the common folk think. Fucking Rhaenyra says that. Right. <laughs> she does. Like, damn. <laughs> no. Yeah, I, I, feel, I feel like uh, on this podcast, we're very team green. Um, I, like I like team green. I'm uh, team common like folk. Team <laughs> Callum is team... <laughs> a little I'm team combo. nine penny kings. Let's do this. <laughs> we need to have another one. We need to have another discussion about like who would ultimately better be better for the small folk. I feel like that would be an interesting debate. Um Yeah, because the answer is no one. <laughs> yeah, none of them. I I don't know. One of the dead ones probably. <laughs> but uh yeah, I, I, I really do like Fabian. I think he does I, I really wish they would do a little bit more to maybe age him up. Uh, because you're totally right, Hillary. They don't age up any of the male actors except for like the obvious transition from child to man. And he he's handsome, but like he, uh, Fabian is just like you know he would get a little bit you know more uh, disheveled I, as. I saw salt and pepper in that hair. Yeah, but like the woman he, changed I so fundamentally. He shoots. You could not whoops. see it. You, okay, you but not see it. Okay, wait, 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 wait. First of all, Fabian is someone who has to do exercise literally every day. Okay, that is true. How much exercise do you think, like, Allison and Rhaenyra are getting in every day? Rhaenyra, maybe, because she has to do all the dragon riding and stuff, but probably not as much. And they also developed from a younger age than Fabian did. There is a certain point where you do just kind of look the same for a bit. Yeah, he did sort of just, like, come in and, in like, the late 20s, and it's like, all right, well, I'm just going to look like this for, like, 20 years. And, and if we're talking about aged up, fucking Viserys. <laughs> Oh yeah, they he got hit by the Mack truck of eight. <laughs> yeah, puberty but, hit him thrice. <laughs> when you consider like, okay, so Fabian, we see him the first time before Allison is even married to Viserys. And then think about like comparatively look at Aegon and Aemond and think that he is that he has looked almost exactly the same since before they were even born. Yeah, that is a bit weird. It's a little bit weird. Okay, I do I, raise you Keanu Reeves. <laughs> are we saying that uh Kristen cole is the keanu reeves of of, of the of <laughs> i feel like i can make that statement and be right <laughs> okay well <clears throat> that's not <clears throat> i'm starting to cough a little bit more so maybe we should uh yes uh, end the podcast here uh hillary why don't you shout yourself out Oh, um, yeah, I am Hillary, aka Hills Alive on YouTube. Um, if you're interested in lots of House of the Dragon, Game of Thrones, A Song of Ice and Fire discussion, uh, that is pretty much all that I do. So, I would highly recommend her videos, especially if you are interested in actual nuanced conversations, because I think her videos will give you a really good perspective that's not just clouded by main character syndrome. 
Uh, <laughs> yeah, she, uh, the Heels Alive videos are incredible. Uh, thank you so much for being on the show with us, Hillary. Uh, thank you so much, Emilio, for powering through. All Sorry about all the coughing in this video, y'all. We're all kind of a little bit coffee over here. But thank you so much, <laughs> you guys, for, for joining us today. And I guess final word on Christian Cole, yeah or nay, is he good or, or bad? I like him, but he's definitely not, like, shining. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, would say uh, interesting. Is yeah, the he's very interesting. And uh, there's no like really good guys, but he's very interesting. And I really would like to see what they do with him in season two. Good character, bad person. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> good character, uh, uh, morally dubious person, maybe. Yes. Thank you yeah. so much. We bring it but right back to the beginning of this episode where I said duplicitous. Anyway, <laughs> thank you. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week. If you're watching this, please go and check out our socials. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. We're on Patreon. We're on Discord. You can join our Discord. It's The links are all in the, the uh, description below. So are the links to Hillary's channel. Please go and check her out. Subscribe. Watch our videos. Pay us money. Please. Please. <laughs> please. But uh, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your week. And... Have a good one. Yeah, bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. This episode and episodes like these are made possible thanks to our amazing patrons, including Dorian, Liam Anderson, and Ab Wei Chung. Thank you so much for watching. Go and check out our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash bite marks and support the show however you can which means subscribing to the Patreon or simply just telling people about it. We're trying to hit a thousand subscribers and a certain amount of watch time so that we can monetize the channel finally, but any kind of support can help. And thank you so much again for watching. Have an incredible, incredible day.